Um, yes, our family have farmed in the Thorny area, Crowland area, um, since um, the early 1600s. We've moved from Peterborough to Crowland to Thorny to Spalding in that time. So we've only moved in a, in a radius of, of uh, 20 mile in what, 400 years. The area of the fens, 75,000 acres and a fen and marsh. And I will say, I'll come to why I in, uh, do stress that marsh as well. Evidence of agrarian practices during the Bronze Age, uh, mainly on the fen edge, which you must have seen uh, uh, must farm and uh, flag fen. A lot of evidence of Roman occupation in and all over the fens. Um, that is the car dike, which runs from Peterborough up to Lincoln, uh, 57 miles. Now, whether that's, um, it's, it's still debatable whether that is Roman or Saxon and Link's um, archaeology have done a lot of work on it and they even say that they're not too sure. And they're not too sure really whether it was for navigation or whether it was a catchwater drain. I would think it was probably both. But it would definitely be taking produce and goods out of the fen. They wouldn't be bringing anything in. Uh, evidence of Rome, and that's on a farm of ours at Thorny. And that are, there were crop marks photographed after the war. And you, that area covers about five, 500 acres, that site. So you can see the size of that Roman settlement, which was, there's a lot of Roman settlements all across the interior of the fens, so the fens must have been drier at that particular period. Um, it's, it's quite, there's a wind farm on there now, and when they did the archaeological survey, they found not one scrap of evidence, nothing at all. Um, from of Roman remains there. I think a lot of it, a lot of these remains actually with the cultivation and rotavators that we use, especially after the war, if there was stuff, it's probably been uh, chewed up. It's a, to give you some idea of the very early farming, this is from Peterborough records from Peterborough Abbey as it was then, and there's very little mention of the, uh, of the fens uh, in, that, in that period. Um, so obviously the, the, they really didn't take a lot of produce, mainly fish and eels and sedge out of the fen. And uh, the fen, it's a very fragile, uh, um, um, it's very fragile management. And during dry periods, it revert to car and stock couldn't get in. Um, mostly they were using oxen for ploughing and they wouldn't go in the fen. And to give you some idea, in the 11th century, there was one horse for 18 oxen. The horse came in later, the 14th century, they were using a lot of horses, and one horse there to 1.78 ox, uh, oxen. But the fen then became quite an area for breeding horses, and that carried on right into the 19th century, especially with the Shire horses. Medieval period, well, the population was governed, as it was in those days, governed by famine and disease. Um, the 13th century, there was a, a run of poor harvest due to cold weather, wet weather all across Europe. And arable land became overcropped and uh, the yields declined. Uh, management was very poor, especially on the common lands. The Black Death reduced the population between the 13th and 14th century. And it reduced it enormously, which obviously reflected in the demand for food. Some villages in Cambridge have suffered losses of 50 to 70%. Can you all hear me standing at the side here? Yeah, fine. But the population during the 15th century, it increased and there was a demand for food. We'd got no colonies then, not around the world, and so investors were looking for home-produced food. And the fens with three quarters of a million acres for the taking, if they could drain it, was the ideal Klondike. Tenure of land changed at that period as well. It was all on short leases, which didn't give tenants really any stability, looking ahead for fertility. And so longer term um, fixed uh, copyhole came out with fixed term and even lifetime tenancy. So a tenant then could look way ahead and look after his farm. He had more incentive to, to look after it, manage it. 
The Fens, as I said, it was probably the, the major area of the whole of the UK that was where this food could be produced if they could drain it. And at that time, the Fen was mostly pastoral farming. And pastoral farming, you needed summer and winter grazing. A lot of the Fen didn't have that. It didn't have winter grazing and, it, and also a lot of the summer grazing. If you've got floods in July, which can be terribly wet. So there was never really any, any good grazing there. But there was in certain areas, um, I mean, this is um, Fenland, commoning of villages was very common. And if you look around the Fens today, uh, you'll see the wide open spaces are where those commons and last enclosed areas were. Um, I haven't put all the villages, but there's a village really that, that goes to each arrow on that. Well, if I put all those on, you wouldn't see the map at all. But what the most interesting area that I found on the intercommoning was the, uh, uh, the, the seven towns of, of Smeath. So there's Tilney, Walpoles, Terrington, Clench, Wharton, Emnath, West Walton, and the seven towns of Smeath. Well, they were intercommoning on the Smeath, which is near Wisbridge, near Friday Bridge, not Friday Bridge, Emnath, out that way. And it was a high piece of grazing, very good. It was summer and winter grazing. And to give you some idea of the wealth of those towns, if you go around now and see the churches, you can see they're magnificent. Some of them are like small cathedrals. And Lynn and South Lynn, if you look at the assessments of the townships at that period, um, in Norfolk in 1334, Lynn and South Lynn, 68 pounds, uh, Thetford, 16. And then if you look at the villages there, Terrington, 40, Walpole, 35, Tilney, 30. Walsoak and 26, West Walton, 20. they were very, very, very wealthy towns, plus they had some good arable land as well. The Smeath covered about 15, 1,600 acres, and it was winter and summer grazing. The Fen nearby, uh, it, wasn't summer, it wasn't winter grazing, it, it was liable for flooding. And to give you some idea of the value of, of, of grassland then, or good meadowland, and one acre of meadow was worth more than two or more acres of arable land. So it was very prime arrow, um, farmland. The Smeath was enclosed in 1796 by Act of Parliament, and the Fen came later. Unlike many commons that were enclosed, the, uh, the, the villagers maintained their rights, and so they had grazing rights, and because it was high land, it was soon converted to arable farming. But the drainage of the Fens really began in earnest in the, the 17th century with this demand for food. Uh, James I, our, our monarchs then, and Charles I, they had a go, not really successfully, but I won't cover too much on this because you've been, uh, had a very good paper this morning on, on the drainage. William Russell, fourth Earl of Bedwards, was an early pioneer, as you've been told, Cornelius Vermoyden and Vernatti, and we still have the Vernatz drain uh, near Spalding. But it was the fourth Earl of Bedford, uh, first Duke of Bedford, uh, that was the major player in the draining. Drainage continued in the 17th and 18th century, and um, there were 50,000 acres um, embanked from the wash. And I'll come to that later if I've got time. The Corn Laws of, of 1360, they were repealed in 1846. Um, because they wanted cheaper food from abroad uh, to feed the industrial growing population. So the Fen and landlords, um, they thought that everything would go up skittled and uh, prices would go down, but they didn't actually, they stayed very buoyant. And a lot of the Fen and landlords, um, the Bedfords and the Burleys, the Exeters, and a lot of other great, because the Fens had attracted most of the aristocratic families of the UK. They wanted a chunk of this prime land. And a lot of them put new buildings up, farmhouses, cottages in the 1860s, and they, you know, farming was going well. But 1870 came, and then the, all this produce and meat and everything was coming from all over the world, from the, from the Americas especially, and cereal prices dropped. And they were the lowest for 150 years. Cheap imports from around the world. There was a gradual decline in farming in incomes. And large areas of the fen reverted back to grass. 
natural regeneration. If you read Alan Bloom's book, Farm in the Fen, he took a farm on later on in the, just before the second, or during the Second World War, that had been farmed in the 1800s, went to dereliction, and then it was re-farmed again when he did it, and now it's back to Wick and Fen. So it's changed, it, it shows that farming land does change its ownership, its usage. Um, that's just a photograph of that uh, cubit wash. And of course, with better drained land, they could harvest hay, and that was a winter feed, so they could carry more stock through the winter. Uh, in medieval times, most of the stock, apart from the breeding stock, was killed off because they couldn't feed it through the winter. They started arable farming on some of the land, and uh, because most of it was, uh, or a lot of it was, was black land, peat land, and even where I farm, a lot of that land had a layer, a thin layer of peat over it in those very early periods. But of course it was difficult to farm, it was lacking in, in lime, so they paired it, and then they burnt it, and then they could grow. But it was, they had to be very careful in doing that, and a lot of landlords did restrict how many times they could burn it, or how many years they had to go in between burning. Claying became another, um, where they were digging clay down and putting it up to mix with the peat to make it more stable. The Victorian era really was, was, was the great era for fen farming, and uh, major influences in agriculture, steam, you see, it's not only the railways, but pumps. We were able to replace the wind engines, the scoop wheels, with steam engine pumps. And, and because the land had still, it was still badly drained before the steam era. Um, the pump, the wind pumps were just not good enough. Traction engines came in so you could grind corn. Stationary engines as well for cutting roots and this sort of thing. Dredges, steam dredges were coming, so the, a lot of the water courses they could get them cleaner, bigger, easier. Excavators, it really did revolutionise the Fen farm. And I think one of the major influences as well was, was the railways came in, and so we could get labour in and we could get produce, fresh produce out to the markets uh, overnight. Artificial fertilisers were just coming in then, and so that helped. You didn't have to rely on crew yard manure. The Royal Agriculture Society of England was formed, and uh, that was in 1840, to advance farming sciences, farming practices, and breeding. That was a typical um, Fenland um, farmyard, and that's on the, uh, that was on the uh, Bedford estate. And you can see there the wonderful buildings, the crew yards, the, the, the houses for the pigs, the farrowing places, and also, um, if I get the button right, a little of the, the engine. A lot of the farms, and I still remember some of those kicking about in the 60s, actually. They'd put steam engines in there for grinding corn and roots and so forth. And there were some magnificent farm buildings, not only in the Fen, but all across the country. It really was, you know, it was, it was the era of the great farm buildings. But of course, then it all went downhill. And that, what happened, really, you see, we replaced the, the, the scoop wheel with the pump. And there's a pump that's on the uh, middle level um, area. It enabled uh, pickers, fruit pickers, to come in from London and other cities. And not only that, we could get, we could get the, uh, the produce out. They're actually flowers, and that's later. But those are flowers going on at Cubitt Station, and they'd be in the market at Covent Garden for the, you know, the next morning. It was a wonderful system. The Great Agricultural Depression at 1870, and it carried on right up just before the First World War because of imports. Many farmers went, many farmers went into derelict, many farms into dereliction, tenants couldn't pay their rents and farmland became worthless. The Duke of Bedford that had 20,000 acres at Thorny, he wanted to sell it at that time, he eventually did sell it, but he said, my Thorny estate is worthless. But one thing he, 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 he prized on, that he never ever turned a tenant out. And that feeling in, in, in that area still holds today the respect for the Bedford. And he sold it in 1909. The story goes that he put, it, he put it up for sale and the Crown wanted to buy it and he wouldn't let them because he knew the Crown would put the rents up 
and it came in front of Parliament and he wasn't going to have that. And so everything was offered to the tenants. It was the, it was the only sale we've ever known of large farm, a block of land with all the shops and the houses and everything in the village that was offered to the tenants. They say whether it's true that he bought the money that he had, he put in Russian railway bonds and apparently that they became worthless. But whether that's true, I don't know. World War I came, farming picked up again. My father always said that you're heroes in the war. I won't, want it, I won't quote what he said, what farmers are caught, think, thought of between the wars. Um, but there was the loss of grassland because the, 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 that was the summer, you know, the last bit of grass was coming up then. There was some left, but not a lot. The post-war years, the late 1920s and early 30s, we had an agricultural slump again. And why did we have that slump? Well, what have I got? Oh, we had in the war, yeah, increased production, compulsory cultivation of grasslands. Oh, I've gone up, I've gone a year there, go back one. Why did that, I must have flicked that out, the other one. Why, why land, a lot of land was sold after the First World War. And the re there were many reasons. Farmland prices had gone up. So a lot of landlords thought we can get rid now because there's going to be another depression, which there was. Also, the Russian Revolution, they thought it was spread across France and maybe spread across so they thought they'd get rid of land because that would be confiscated. And also, there were a lot of death duties to pay. I think there was 40% of the whole of the UK farm estates were sold in that period. But of course, the slump did come again. Five minutes, I've been told. <laughs> Um, the slump did come again, 27. World War II increased production, compulsory cultivation of grassland. We've gone through that, grants to break land up. That was the breaking up of the land. Entry into the common market, which did change farming enormously. Um, and it, what it, it turned a lot of us into specialist growers. We then found that with the corn price, the wheat, the cereal prices going up, we didn't bother with certain crops. And so a lot of crops became specialist crops. You had you know, agribusiness growing nothing but potatoes or onions or carrots and this sort of thing. So it did change. The supermarkets as well changed it. They wanted a, a more uniform product for packing and whatnot. So some of the crops, like carrots, moved onto the silt and out of the black onto the, onto the, um, the sand land where they could grow a uniform carrot. Large organisation, grower organisations. Contract farming came in. Environmental schemes. That's the sort of cropping today we're talking about. All big high-tech stuff. Tractors, a lot of these tractors now, they're all operated um, with GPS so they're self-steer. And yet we still have there an old boy that I know, he's got 50 acres and he still makes a living, selling to farm shops and also putting his produce into the auction. That's carrot lifting. There we've got a, a man at the top there, Sonny. He's got 40 acres with his family there and he makes a living. Uh, LFB here, 16,000 acres. That's the difference. That's why the, the chapter in the book is called Fields of Spark. We still have that sort of farming in. Vast agribusiness and still... This, whether that will carry on, who knows? Potatoes. Large agribusiness. Two old boys there grow four acre potatoes and pick them. Lettuce planting. Those crops have, de have declined, the flowers... But not the daffodils. We are now major, we are major exporters of daffodils to Holland, but the tulip industry did go into decline. Those are foreign people picking um, um, daffodils, foreign labour. That's a sort of high tech equipment again. Peas, how the pea job. They were picked to start with by hand, and then they went into the factories on the horn, the canning. Smedley's and a lot of the uh, other firms set up businesses. Now we have viners. These are viners on our fields in a wet year, 68. We had to put crawlers on to pull them. Now we've got these sort of viners, four of those. They've been replaced, and there's two now do that whole 11,000 acres of peas. Ever-changing labour force. 
German prisoners, Italian prisoners, Irish potato pickers and students there at Chivers Hartley's on Pease. Land Army girls, refugees from Hungary at the, uh, in Wisbridge there, uh, people come for work on the, from up north, unemployed, um, foreign pickers again. Foreign pickers, pickers, pickers. Every industry uh, in the Fens, Bercy. Land ownership has changed. How am I doing, Mark? <laughs> yeah. um, you can probably read that anyway. Really sort as normal. Who owns it now then? Um, I don't know how that one got in actually. It's jumped. That's the Bedford estate that was sold. That got left as well. Present day owners, the Crown Estate, 62,000. County County, they're rough figures because some of it's Fen Edge, some of it's just out of the Fen. So that acquaint those two and the councils, 14%, private individuals, charitable trusts, colleges, pension funds, owner of charities. Oldest landowners that I found were the, the Crown Estate, Childers Trust and the church. That's modern. Uh, is this the way we're going? Straw for burners for the factory, um, AD plants over here and solar panels here, wind farm there. Maybe that's the future. And the environment, that is the Great Fen project. So what's in the future for Finland farmers with Brexit? A period of uncertainty, as far as I know. We don't know where we're going to go. Uh, we could see agriculture. If it follows how it has in, in twice in, in, since the 1800s, it could go in decline at the expense of cheap food from around the world due to new trade agreements. Um, but one cannot separate politics from agriculture. You can't. And... Uh, it's a really a question of who holds the trump card. 